Okay, so this is pretty big news and it's actually quite difficult to miss unless you've been hiding under a rock. But very recently on the 12th of September, so yesterday at the time of recording, OpenAI have released the O1 family of models. Now, these models are essentially designed to do more thinking or more reasoning before they give you the solution to the problem. And in so doing, they're able to solve more complex problems and behave a little bit more like a human or a team of humans who are trying to work through a problem. Now, these models come in three flavors. You've got O1 Preview, O1 Mini, and O1 Full, which you can't access here. We won't call it O1 Full, we'll just call it O1 for now. But basically, O1 you can't access. As of yesterday, ChatGPT, the client, if you have the paid version, you can access O1 Preview, and you can access O1 Mini. And if you have access to the API, you can access the same two models there. Now, in terms of ChatGPT, the users of ChatGPT Plus and ChatGPT Team can access these new models as of yesterday. You simply need to select them as you're going to make your request here. And now you're using preview. But fear not, they are also planning to bring O1 mini access to all ChatGPT free users, although they haven't announced when at this point. Now, if you've been hearing a lot about the term strawberry and other terms that have been bandied about, essentially O1 is the new name for this family of models. Now, before we start digging into the models and how they work, it's quite interesting to look at the results of what these models have achieved. Now here you're looking at the results of various competitions from mathematics to coding to physics and you've got PhD level science questions here and you can see the performance of GPT 4.0 is quite low in comparison to O1 Preview and O1 Full which we don't have access to yet is staggeringly more accurate than say GPT 4.0. Now, another incredible thing about O1 is its ability to code. In some respects, it's, it's way better than other models. In other respects, it's much more limited in terms of what you can do. And we'll come on to those limitations. Now, looking at this one is quite interesting because it's the first chart where it shows a human expert in comparison to what you'd get with these models. Of course, when looking at these models, we often assume that the real goal is to get to 100% accuracy. But if a expert human is only 69.7% accurate and O1 is 78% accurate, that becomes very significant because that's the point at which if these models are affordable they're actually superior to a highly trained human being now if you want to dig into these results in a bit more detail you can jump down to the appendix and uh, look at the breakdown here and the kind of metrics and what kind of results were achieved but looking at the conclusion on this page it says that o1 significantly advances the state of art in ai reasoning we plan to release improved versions of this model as we continue iterating so this isn't gpt5 this is kind of work in progress it says that we expect these reasoning capabilities will improve our ability to align models to human values and principles. In other words, it thinks more like a human. We believe that O1 and its successors will unlock many new use cases for AI in science, coding, math and related fields. So for me personally, this doesn't feel like a massive breakthrough in kind of AI capability. Now, this chart is interesting. It shows the percentage of results that are preferred by humans in any given domain. Now it shows that O1 is preferred less than 50% of the time for personal writing. But if you switch to say mathematical calculations, something that requires a lot more reasoning, the preference jumps to over 70%. And again, if you look at the code forces competition, you, you can see that again, it performs much better. And when they're allowed to submit many more submissions, for example, 10,000, they get even better results. Now, before we look at other details like pricing and that kind of thing, one of the most interesting sections on this page of the OpenAI website is this section here, which shows different problems and a comparison between GPT-40 and OpenAI preview models. Now, if we just look at this first example of a cipher and you're trying to ask it to break the cipher, you can see that GPT-40 makes a stab at the problem, tries to break it down and goes kind of step by step, but ultimately it doesn't actually solve the problem and it's asking the user for more information. If we have a look at O1 preview, we see a completely different kind of working process and and in this example here, it shows the chain of thought or the reasoning. And you can see those steps as you go through and it works all the way through and it's going into a lot more detail. And in the end, after all of that reasoning, you get the result. There are three R's in strawberry. If you have a look at coding, again, you've got an example here where it produces a bash script. And I've actually used ChatGPT to produce lots of scripts for me that I would have written by hand in the past. And it's been pretty good. But in this example, write a bash script that takes a matrix represented as a string with format one, two, three, four, five, six, and prints the transpose in the same format. It gets the answer ultimately wrong. The same prompt into O1 preview and you get the right results. Okay. 
Now, if you want to see the chain of thought, which you can't see obviously in this model, because it technically isn't a chain of thought, although there's obviously some working out going on. But if you look at the chain of thought, you can see the broken down steps and what it would have done. A bit like a university student working his way through a problem might work in a similar kind of fashion. And then you get the script at the end and you get the result. And you've got similar scenarios for maths, crosswords, you've got English, science and safety and health science. All right, so let's take a quick look at cost. All right, so let's have a look at pricing. So for OpenAI 01 preview, the price is 15 US dollars for 1 million input tokens and 60 US dollars for 1 million output tokens. And let's compare that to 01 mini, which is $3 per 1 million input tokens and $12 per 1 million output tokens. Now, just to get an idea of comparison, if, if we look at say 40 mini, you've got 0 0.150 for 1 million input tokens and 0.6 dollars for 1 million output tokens. So quite a big difference in price. Now coming over to chat GPT and access limitations, each user has access to 30 messages a week with OpenAI Preview and 50 with OpenAI Mini. Now I would say that these are quite strict usage limitations. They say that the reason for the usage limitations is that these models are more computationally intensive than other models and GPT-40 will continue to be provided unlimited to paid users and they still recommend it as the best model for most tasks and questions. Now, the other thing to consider is that given that these models are doing more thinking and more reasoning, they are actually slower. So that'd be another factor to consider when you look at using these models. Now, one of the interesting things that I noticed about the difference in capabilities between O1 Preview and O1 Mini in terms of the API are not just that Mini is faster and cheaper, but in fact, it says here that O1 Mini may outperform O1 Preview when it comes to coding applications. So that's quite interesting. Actually, it may be preferable to use O1 Mini, even though it's cheaper if you're doing programming tasks. And at the same time, O1 prioritizes speed and cost efficiency. Now on their website and on their YouTube channel, they have some quite swanky videos showing the capabilities of some of the new O1 models. So let's take a quick look at one of these videos. All right, so the example I'm gonna show is uh, writing a code for uh, visualization. So I sometimes teach a class on transformers, which is a technology behind models like ChatGPT. And when you give a sentence to ChatGPT, it has to understand the relationship between the uh, words and so on. So it's a sequence of words and you just have to model that. And transformers utilize what's called a self-attention to model that. So I always thought, okay, if I can visualize a self-attention mechanism and uh, with some interactive components to it, it will be really great. I just don't have the skills to do that. So let's ask our new model, O1 Preview, to help me out on that. So I just typed in uh, this command uh, and see how the model does. So unlike the previous models like GPT-40, it will think before outputting an answer. So it starts started thinking. As it's thinking, let me uh, show you what are some of these uh, requirements. I'm giving a bunch of requirements to think through. So first one is like, use an example sentence, the quick brown fox. And second one is like, when ho hovering over a token, visualize the edges whose thicknesses are proportional to the attention score. And that means just if the two words are more relevant, then have a thicker edges and so on. So the one common failure modes of the existing models is that when you give a lot of the instructions to follow, it can miss one of them. Just like humans can miss one of them if you give too many of them at once. So because this reasoning model can think very slowly and carefully, it can go through each requirement uh, in depth and that reduces the chance of missing um, the instruction. So this output code, let me copy paste this into a terminal. So I'm gonna use the, the editor of 2024. So vim HTML. So I'm just gonna paste this thing into that and just save it out. Uh, and on the browser, I'll just try to open this up. And you can see that uh, when I hover over this thing, it shows the arrows um, and then quick and brown and so on. And when I hover out of it, it goes away. So that's a correctly rendered um, version of it. Now when I click on it, it shows the attention scores as just, just as I asked for. And maybe there's a like little bit of rendering, like it's overlapping, but other than that, it's actually much better than what I could have done. Yeah, so this model did uh, really nicely. I think this can be a really useful tool for me to come up with a bunch of different visualization tools for uh, my new teaching sessions.
All right, so pretty swanky. So let's go ahead and try it out for ourselves. Let's go over to ChatGPT and let's select 01 Mini because as the FAQ suggested, it may actually be better for a programming task. So I'm just gonna paste in my prompt here. So here we have a fairly rudimentary request and let's see how it gets on. Thinking crafting the animation. Now we can't actually click on this and, oh no, we can, we can see a little bit about the details. All right, that's cool. So here we've got our codes. I'm just going to copy this. We've got some good explanation here as well and customization tips. So let me just copy this into a file and open it in the browser. All right, it doesn't really look massively like a butterfly. I'm not entirely sure what that looks like, but it is moving around the screen. It's not using any external libraries. Um, so yeah, maybe that's pretty cool. Let's see if we can improve it slightly. Yep, you can see the steps that it's working through. Let's just click on that. All right, so it's showing us the steps that it went through. So let's minimize that again. Okay, let's copy the code. Animated Fox, so if I refresh this, let's see if it looks any better. Ah, okay. It doesn't look like an animal anymore. So, but, Oh, it's disappeared off the screen as well. Okay, I wasn't expecting that to happen. Let's try that again. If I stop, that stops moving. If I click it again, it starts moving but it doesn't look like an animal and it has disappeared off the screen. And if I click again, nothing happens because it's just got off the screen. So as you can see, it's not perfect. It didn't follow all of my prompts perfectly. It didn't retain the previous information that I'd given it very well because I said I wanted it to be an animal and the title of the page is still Animated Fox, but yeah, it's kind of like not too bad. But yeah, it's something and it's moving. And if I had to write this by hand, it would take me a lot longer, even though it's not exactly to spec. So, so yeah, not too bad. So how can we conclude? Well, my gut feeling is that it is a step forward. It is an improvement because you can see from the results, but then it's more resource intensive and it's doing more work and it's costing more. And at least in the example where we tested, it didn't produce some kind of groundbreakingly brilliant result. It, it still produced something that would require tweaking and changing and um, making more prompts and that kind of thing. But this kind of work to engineer around the problem by producing different strategies of how it goes about solving the problems, i.e. breaking the problem down into tasks and steps and showing its reasoning, I think has two benefits. One is obviously in certain domains, it's producing markedly better results. But the other thing is it allows humans who are feeding back to the system to see the kind of chain of thoughts and steps that it went through to produce the results, which is better than most of what we've seen with AI, where you put in a prompt and you get a result and you really have a very little idea of how it came to those results. So if you can see the chain of thought, you could tweak individual parts of that chain of thought and not just get better results, but actually tweak the way it goes through its thinking process. So it feels a lot more like stacking multiple AIs together to produce a better result. And we've seen similar things in the past with Google's alpha code. All right, before I sign out, I would recommend one other thing, which is to watch this video, Scott Wu's OpenAI around coding. It takes a lot of effort to, to build code that runs consistently and works very well, right? And I think the thing that's really, really exciting now is every human is, is going to be able to build way more. Um, and there's so much more to build. And that's, that's, that's what gets me really excited. Yeah, I'm Scott Wu. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Cognition. The thing that's, that's interesting about programming is that it's, it's changed in shape like over and over over the last you know, 50 years. Programming used to be punch cards, you know, and people used to, I mean, that was how it was first done, right? Yeah, I won't play the whole video. I'll let you go away and watch that. Now, I won't go ahead and play the video, but the video is from Cognition and Cognition are the people behind Devin, the AI software engineer that's coming to take your job. So if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend watching that video and looking into that as a next step. So that's pretty much it for this video. If, if you're interested in tech, programming, AI, and business news, make sure you hit subscribe. I'm probably going to be making more videos on the OpenAI 01 models. So make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss out on those. And if you found this video useful, it's really helpful if you hit the thumbs up icon. Thank you for watching.